of all of the trickster stories and all of that that that, that happened. So during that period of time, where it was all of the animals, there was uh, uh, there were these um, three woodpecker brothers, and they were in, traveling in an area from an area down by where Yellowstone Park is today, and they was traveling northwest towards par par parts of our country. And on that journey, there was a, a, a monster, a water monster. When they stopped to get a drink in one of the streams, the water monster came up and swallowed the youngest woodpecker brother and went back into the water and tried to get away. And so the other two woodpecker brothers proceeded to chase him and they was going after him to try to, to, try to catch him, to try to free their younger brother. And they chased him through the water systems from that place all the way up through the Northwest, up to the Northwest part of Montana. There's a, the Kootenai River that comes from Canada, goes down through the United States and goes back into Canada. And when they was chasing him in that area, there was a, there was a giant that lived in that area that was, that was, um, decided he was watching the proceedings and he decided that he would try to help the Woodpecker brothers. And so he used his arms, his forearm to block the river. So Yawunik, who is the water monster, how he wouldn't get past. And so Yawunik came up the river up to his forearm and then he used his other forearm to block his escape. And so he had him trapped in there. And once he had Yawunik trapped, the Woodpecker brothers were able to catch up to Yawunik and, um, and um, cut him open and free their younger brother. And they were so pleased and grateful to uh, the giant that helped them. And the giant that helped them, his name was Nashmuktsin. And um, Nashmuktsin, um, after helping them, they, uh, they, they, told, they told him, you can have Yawunik, you can have his body to do whatever you want with. And, uh, you know, as, 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 as payment, as thanks for, for, what, um, for, what, for what was going on, for, for what happened, for helping us to save our younger brother. And so Nasmuktsin then reached inside of uh, Yawunik's body and pulled out the rope and threw it across the big waters to the west and said, where you land, you will be the people, the human beings there. And he reached inside and pulled out the liver and threw it across the big waters to the southeast and said, and where you land, you will be, become the human beings there. And he pulled out the tallow out of Yawunik and threw it across the waters to the east and said, and where you land, you will become the human beings there. So basically what Nashmuktsin was doing was taking Yawunik's body all apart piece by piece and scattering it throughout the earth and to become the human beings. And when he was all done, all that was left was blood. And he wiped his hands on the grass here and said, and, and you will become the human beings here. And so, it was said that Yawunik, that um, Nafmuktsin was so big, was so large, that if he ever stood up, he would hit his head on the sky and fall over and die. And so wherever he went, he crawled on his hands and knees. But after he had taken Yawunik and scattered him throughout the earth, he stood up and he hit his head on the sky and he fell over and died. So uh, what I was saying about um, Google Earth. So if you Google Earth and go to this, this area of the country, you will see, you'll see Nachmuktsin, the creator of all of human beings. And he, his feet are up in Northern British Columbia and his body stretches down and his head 
was where Yellowstone Park is. And you'll be able to see that. You'll be able to see that, that outline of his body there. Now, of course, this this all of these happenings happened way before Google Earth, but Google Earth certainly uh, certainly was able to confirm the, the truthfulness of the story. And so and, and that is where all of the human beings came from, was from was from that. Um, now, during the next during the next periods of time, when the human beings arrived, and they started to travel throughout the throughout the territory, the different um, spirits would step forward that had gone through these battles and would step step forward and help them. And how I would help them was by teaching them a song, teaching them a song. And then, um, and then offering some kind of help, whatever it was that they would be able to do to help, to help them with them, with their health or with their food or with things, material things to make life easier. And that that's what that's what they would uh, that that's what those spirits would do for the human beings. And so, you know. This happened for the next 10,000 generations of human beings. And so you could get a sense of what kind of a worldview would happen, what kind of a worldview would come out of all of that. It's one that, you know, if you, wherever you went, there were songs that were revealed. There was help that was received from everything that was around. And you do that for that many generations of people, the intrinsic worldview of the people that comes out of that consists basically of a couple of things. One, that absolutely everything has a spirit. There are no inanimate objects. Everything has a spirit and everything has songs and everything has the potential to help. And us as human beings, we were the last to be created and it's all our older brothers. And so when we, you know, we don't have the kind of spiritual power that is out there. And so we, we survive based on that, the, the help from those, from, from that spiritual power that exists in the natural world around us. And so that's the way they carried themselves on the earth. They carried themselves in a way of knowing that um, carried themselves in a way of knowing that that no matter what you do, no matter what what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what you think, there is always someone there listening. In, wilderness was was just not a concept you're never alone you're always you're, you're there's always a presence always the presence of all of the past listening to you and watching you and so the people carried themselves that way um in, in, in such a respectful humble way of being the the last of creation to be to be placed here and dependent upon all of the rest of it for our survival. Now, the Western way of viewing things is, you know, is is, is different as you as you can tell. You know, the um, um, man is controlling. Man is on top of the hierarchy, and so with the um, with the assimilation efforts for all of the things that have been, been placed on all of the native peoples to assimilate into that Western way of thinking about things where money is important, where material things are important, where man is the top of all powerful power within the, within the natural world. That's a completely different way of looking at it. And so through the assimilation efforts that have taken place, today we are living in kind of a, a continuum that the people are placed somewhere on a continuum 
of total traditionalism where they carry themselves on the earth. There are folks who carry themselves on the earth the way the ancestors did, all the way to those who accept the total Western way of life where chasing after money and things of materialism and believing in, um, in the way um, science has figured everything out and, and that, that way of life. And I'm, and I'm not saying that as, as um, to mean that that's negative and that's a bad way or anything. It's just different. It's a different way of carrying yourself as a different way of viewing the world. It has taken over everything. So I can't really say that it's, you know, that it, that, that it isn't powerful because we're all under the influence of the Western world. So, um, but it's just a different way of looking at it. So all of the, all of the native people are somewhere on that continuum of carrying themselves, of dancing in the winter time, of speaking their traditional languages, of carrying themselves on with the awareness of what is of what is around us. From that and all the way into the total acceptance of the Western world. All in between there are our tribal members, our, our Indians who are members of different tribes that are there. So, um, you know, um, that's, that's, that's basically where we are today. And those, some of the, some of the people can fit into the Western way and can adapt to it and adjust to it and live just fine. And, and move on just fine. You know, we had a tribal councilman who said, you know, I know nothing of the language. I know nothing of the culture. I don't practice any of the old ways and I'm doing just fine, thank you. And it's true. There's some, some folks can adjust to that, but many of the people who try to find a, a, a peace or, or where they are, where, they, where they're at inside their heart, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into the Western way. And that's where a lot of our social ills come from. That's where we see a lot of our social problems coming from. And so that is why the culture committees and the cultural um, revival efforts that are happening within all of the tribes, helping those people to find the place where they fit, to find, the, you know, the, the people who learn the language and you start practicing the cultures and everything you find a place where yeah this fits this fits for me you know and they find uh, a greater peace and and a lot of the, the social illnesses um, go away so um so yeah um that's that's where we're at right now and so in 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 your classrooms you will see you will see tribal people that are somewhere on that continuum. And so some of the folks, like I said, have adjusted to, they, they, they look just like me, but they, they have adjusted to Western way of life so much so and are, and are doing just fine. And that's okay. And that's good. There are others who are having trouble finding their place, finding their identity, finding what fits for them finding the truth that is really in their heart. And they're the ones who need, who need to be guided towards going to traditional folks and learning and learning more of the language and learning more of the, the, their own tribe's history and culture and, and the ways of carrying themselves. And it, will, and it will fit for them a lot better. So um, I hope that, uh, this uh, our our short and little little um, stint through here, and, and I and I raced through. You know, a friend of mine was telling me that whole creation story, and we started one evening, and and the next morning um, we got to the place to where human beings were around, and his grandmother, the sun was coming up, and his grandmother came out of the house and called us in to for breakfast. So, but I gave you the even the um, uh, my nudist uh, part of the Reader's Digest version of, of, of the story. But I hope that you get kind of a sense 
of to have been able to get kind of a sense of, of you know some of the issues and, and, and where and, and where where we are as tribal people. I want to thank um, OPI for um, Indian education for all because especially for that has really helped an awful a lot of people to understand traditional ways a little bit more. But um, I don't know if I've gone over time or not, Jennifer. Um, so, so Vernon, this is Zach Hawkins. Uh, I'm jumping in and pinch hitting for Jennifer. She had to jump on to the next section, but uh, I, we are at time, but I do appreciate you uh, sharing that in, in a limited time. And I think um, is there's a lot of good information uh, for all of us in there. So uh, I do want to thank you. Um, of the folks that are on, uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to type in the chat for, for Mr. Finley here? I want to thank you for this opportunity. You know, I, I, the way that I look at it, okay, technology, you know, it was those, it was the, uh, uh, um, it was meant to be the way that it was shortened. I was supposed to give you only this version. All right. Uh, we do have a, a question here from Keevan Crawford, okay. who's over in Hart Butte. Says, can you describe a magpie as black and white or white and black? But if we don't introduce <laughs> them to our children, they will have no color. So maybe that's an inside joke. <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, and our our story about that is probably similar to yours. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> like that. All right. Magpie probably has kind of served the same role in there, you know, the uh, one where we give the um, magpie name uh, to um, is the one who is all over and chattering and into everybody's business and everything, you know, that's a good, that's a good Indian name for somebody that, that, that has that kind of, uh, those kinds of uh, social skills. All right. Um, I was going to ask you to, um, so I'm familiar with the, um, the, the Kootenai tribe up in Cranbrook on their, their website, there's a creation story, but is that, a different variation or same as the like the Kootenai and uh, like where you are. Yeah, you know, um, that's that that that's uh, that's a that's a really good question because um, you know when I was growing up, I would hear the different stories told slightly different from different people, and I used to speak with I, I shared a bedroom with my grandfather growing up, and when I would when I would talk to him about uh, about things and he would say you know the reason why you know um that, that, that that's a that, that's a good educational question because he said you know the way when you hear a story and the way that you understand it and the way that you hear it and the way that you understand it is right it's the right way it's the right way for you to understand for today and 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 when and, and when the um, and next year, if you hear that same story again and you get something else out of it, that uh, that is also right. So it wasn't, you know, there wasn't such a thing as um, well. The moral of the story is this, or this is what you're supposed to get out of that story. This is what you're supposed to learn, which is really an important concept in education because from the traditional Kootenai view, one of the most disrespectful things I could do to you is to tell you how you're supposed to understand something, what it is that you're supposed to understand. And, and in Western education, that's everything. The whole purpose is for you to memorize certain things we call facts. And the more that you memorize and can regurgitate them on the test, uh, the more educated you're considered. But in traditional scrutiny way, 
your growth, uh, your growth through your understanding, the way that it is, is right. It's, it's the right way that you're supposed to that you're supposed to do it. So you know. Um, so with stories, it's the same thing. What you get out of it, and and what they get out of it, and what what they have put on their site, and the way that they get what they get out of it is um, is probably different than the way that I do now. And if you went through and looked at it again, it might even you might even understand things a little bit differently the next time. And that's and that's right. That's that's the uh, right correct way. There is there isn't. Um, in traditional Putin view, there isn't a, there isn't one right answer for everything that fits for everybody at, at any given time. So, so you get question. you get what you need when you need it. That's Absolutely. It yep. Yep. And the most respectful thing I can do to you is to share with you what I know and the way that you understand what I shared with you is right. And I'm not supposed to tell you how you're supposed to interpret it. Right. Yeah, that's some powerful insight when you think about, like you said, Western Western education models and, and Native children. Yeah. All right. Well, I do appreciate your uh, being here with us today. Um, I need to hold on. So I'm going to stop recording. So. Let's see. The um, the Kootenai language is a, a considered a language isolate by the by the linguists. You know the um, the by isolate it means you know the linguists have been, they've gone through their whole studies doctoral studies to link to different tribal languages into different families and. Um, but the Kootenai language doesn't fit into any of the families, and so that they're they're considered a language isolate, which, for me, is the strongest um, argument or the strongest position um, that says you know the Kootenais were always right here. There is no other language; uh, it doesn't fit into any of the language families anywhere in the world. We didn't migrate anything. We're we were, we were um, always right here. And so um, the, the, you know, some of the sounds are slightly different than in, than in English. Um, and I'll go through some of it, uh, some of it with you, you know, and, and, and having the correct sound is pretty important as far as what you, what you mean, you know, um, because our class, um, means um means a cloud you know yeah. and so there's um and then there's not cash and not cash and that are that sound similar very similar to to uh to water but those are three completely different you know one is gloves and one is um like a sack a gunny sack or something and then the other is a cloud so how you pronounce something is 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 pretty important as far as what what, what the meaning is, and so that has kind of been uh, and and uh, the major emphasis in the in the Kootenai language and, and learning in the Kootenai language. But the um, um, but the, the 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 part that I wanted to share with you mostly was about the uh, how um, you know. Languages have to adapt to the world around them, and how and, and and how new words come into a language is of critical importance because the way that we're trying to teach it is we're teaching it so that so that the um, the, the rules within the grammar structure are are followed. In, in coming up with the new words. For example, there's a couple of ways that um, that uh, new words come in. Um, one word, you know, or is is uh, using phonetics. One way is using phonetics, like um, there is no p p sound in the Kootenai language. Um, the closest that your 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 mouth can 
comes within the Kuri language of saying a P is a, is, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a P, but no M as in rank. Um, and so the closest you can come to an F sound is a, is a P sound. And so, um, so the word coffee, you know, there was no sound in, in the Kootenai language. And so people um, more recently um, use the word coffee because there's, there's a P sound, but no F sound. So they say coffee, but from uh, someone who only knew Kootenai language, that word wouldn't mean anything. There is no, there is no, you know, there, there would, if they heard the word, it wouldn't attach any meaning to it. And, um, but the original word for Kootenai, uh, for coffee in Kootenai was, um, you know, was the word that, that translates to mean bitter drink. So, you know, now that, that word would have some meaning to a, to a fluent speaker. So one way that a new, you know, new words come in, like um, there wasn't, a, traditionally there wasn't the L sound in, in Kootenai, but there was like a voiceless L, you know, if you say L, oh, and use your voice, oh, and, and realize where your tongue is placed and how you make the sound. Now, if you take away your voice and just blow air around your tongue, that's, that's a sound that is in Kudu, but there is no, there, traditionally there was no L sound. And so, um, um, so Mary, so with no R sound became ma fe, you know, because the closest to a er was us in, in, in the language. So Mary became ma fe. So, and later when they adapted to having an L sound, ma fe became ma le. So, um, uh, but those words don't really mean, you know, um, anything like I said within the language. Now, for example, the word for car is kanashkats. Kanashkats means um, it's something that can go under its own power. Um, and um, so, you know, um, it, it, it travels under its own power. Now that has meaning. So, so, um, you know, um, so they wouldn't, you know, so, so those are two different ways that, that, that new words come into the language. And what I always encourage our language learners to, to figure out and to get to a level of fluency that they can do this is to, is to um, you know, come up with new words in, a, in, in the traditional way. The, the, the Kootenai way of doing something was, what is the verb? What is the verb that is attached to that? What does it do? And, and, and then that's using that verb, you come up with the, with, with the word for, for, for what it is, rather than just pronouncing the English word with as close as you can to the Kootenai language, you know, so having a meaning behind it from within the from within the worldview is, is, is what we encourage with the language and, and where we're where we're trying to get to. So you know um, there have been many efforts um, to try to revive the language and the Kootenai languages. I mean, you know, I have a a, a pro friend who came and visited with a group of young people and group of young men and they all spoke pro with one another during the conversations and but they were very concerned about about their language you know disappearing and relatively speaking you know I was thinking you know wow I mean all of all of the Kootenai highly fluent speakers are gone are gone now and 
the ones that we're producing now that to try to get them to a, to a higher level is uh, 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 that, that, that's where we're at. That's what we have. You know, that, that's going to be it. And so um, you know, talk about endangered languages, you know, as a language isolate, especially, it's we're at a very, very critical, critical place to saving our language. And so, um, but that's that's. I, I just wanted to share a little bit about some of the some of the, um, the, the sounds in, in particular, but also about um, the issues around trying to uh, keep the language alive. And how it would adapt to the contemporary world going forward, you know. So, and and I know, you know, um, back in the day, we used to go to the conferences with, um, you know, Dick Little Bear and and Daryl Kip, and and Daryl was really an impressive guy that that was very concerned with. Uh, losing the Blackfeet language and and put together the schools up there. And, you know, I'm proud of him and his family has to be very proud of him for, for all of the work that, that, that happened up there with with the language, you know. Um, because one of the things about working in tribal languages, if you're going to become a tribal language teacher, or try to do something to save your language, the first thing that you have to do is to put on about seven more layers of skin because there will be, there will be uh, certainly a, a, a lot of criticism for any, any way that you, you try to do it. But, but the thing is to push on and, and, and to get it done. Um, and, and to keep going and to keep going because if you produce one speaker, you, you, you've done good and encourage that one to, to spread and to, and, to, and, and to produce more. But yeah, so anyway, that those are a couple of the issues that we have in dealing with uh, dealing with our language. And, uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry to those of you that come on to see Mr. DeRozier because he's, he's, he's very good. I'm very, I was gonna hang around and listen to him too, but I'm sorry that he had some issues that he had to deal with. And, and I apologize to you for not being the presenter who you came here to, to, to speak with. So anyway, um, if there's any further discussions or anything like that, we can have that big way Oh, thank you. So Destin Markland has a question, says, what is your relationship to English? I mean, from an identity perspective. Yeah, you know, English was my first language. You know, my grandparents were fluent in both Salish language and Kootenai language. And um, those are com two completely uh, different languages. You know, like I was saying, the, the word for car in Kootenai is thoughts, which means, um, you know, something that travels under its own power. And the word for car in Salish is depletion, which means wrinkly feet, you know. And so, um, you know, um, so co two completely different languages. Um, but they never, they never talk um, me either of them. And in fact, they kind of, you know, avoided um, me trying to, when I would try to hang around and learn more, they, they avoided that and they encouraged me not to learn the traditional language, not to learn because my grandmother saw it as something that, um, that hindered her in, in the contemporary world, that it held her back and she was always pushing 
pushing me to get educated uh, in the Western educational system and always encouraging me to be educated that way. Um, like I said, I shared a bedroom with my grandfather and he and I uh, at night, you know, he would tell me things and he would ask me things and he was kind of pushing, you know, he knew that um, in the future that a traditional worldview is what would be my saving grace. And so, um, and so, yeah, and so I, 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 he was a medicine man and I, and I, I've seen some amazing things and experienced some amazing things and was able to know for a fact and, and know in my heart, you know, the way the ancestors carried themselves, that everything really does have spirit and everything has power and everything has their ability to help us. So, um, you know, because of my experiences firsthand. And so, um, but I also went to, went to Western education, went to school, you know, I got, you know, my bachelor's in, at the U of M in elementary ed, and my master of education degree and my doctor of education degree at the University of Georgia, et cetera. So I'm considered educated in the Western world, um, but I'm still learning in, in the, the Kootenai world and, you know, would never consider myself fluent or in, in either the culture or the language, but um, but working on it, working on it, you know. But yeah, so that's that's kind of my my placement in, in you know, as far as English goes. I'm in the Western world, I'm considered an educated person, and in the Kootenai world, I'm still a child. So thanks for the question. Good one. Yeah, I think we've we've had that kind of theme. Uh, well, today and certainly I've heard in the past of people of your grandmother's generation and that decision that they made about their language and whether it was something they wanted to continue with or not. Um, I know uh, uh, their teacher. I when I taught in Hayes, I know a teacher there that was there a long time and. Her grandmother told her, never speak your language, it'll just bring you trouble. So, um, and we had Mr. Uh, Tuffy Helgeson from that same reservation talk about when his grandmother said, okay, we're done, we're done with the Catholic Church, we're going traditional again. So, everybody has that journey, but um, thank you for sharing that. Um, are there any other questions for Mr. Finley while we have him here? So I was curious, um, yeah, you know, cause there's, we have the Kootenai uh, on Flathead, we have the Kootenai in Idaho and we have Kootenai and maybe, I know there's Kootenai in Canada, but um, maybe share a little bit of that distinction maybe between those, those groups. You know, um, as far as the language goes, you know, the, um, you know, when languages, um, when they kind of, split up and they kind of break apart like the like for example the salish language the bitterroot salish and uh, uh who, who they call the kellis bells um they it's actually a mispronunciation of their word for themselves which was Kliste. but the Kliste and the bitterroot salish and the spokans and the cordelanes and some of the cultists all speak different dialects of Salish language. And so when the when the language the, the, the band split apart like that, over time the development of it of each of those, you know, they become different dialects, what's called. And then the, you know, and and so there there there's a lot of similarity. They they have the same understanding and the, the core is still the same, but some things are some things are different. Surprisingly, with the Kootenai language, there isn't much there isn't much difference. You know, things didn't change that much throughout with with, with the, the separation of the different bands. You know, uh, the word for uh, bear, for example, here Xanta 
in the, the Sanka language here on the on the Plata Reservation, our way of saying it is Nuku. And in Canada, they say it Nipku, you know. So it just just the differences are are so um, are surprisingly not not that 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 great, you know. And a lot of the understandings and, and, and everything are, are are pretty much the same, which is kind of interesting. I mean, and for example, you know, the word for Kootenai, um, Kootenai, that word has no meaning in our language. You know, it was what somebody else called us. I was at a language conference um, and there was a lady who was, um, Northern Diné, Northern Diné. And the reason they called it Diné was because there was um, Northern Diné because their language was similar to the Navajo, which was, you know, considered Diné. But their languages were kind of the same, but the, there was a there was an elderly lady from the Northern Diné. And I was, and she heard me say, make the statement that Kootenai doesn't mean anything in our language. And she told me, well, the reason why is because it's from our language. In our language, Kootenai means river people, you know? And I thought, oh, wow, okay, that's where it came from. And, but they were further out on the plains, but then when the, you know, when the, um, the traders were coming through and, and, and making trading posts on their way west and they was there, um, um, traded there with the northern Diné and was asking, okay, who's that next group of people further over in the mountains who are them? And so they told them, them oh, they're, they're Kootenai, you know? And so um, so that's what we, that's what they start calling us. Just like here on our reservation, it's called the Flathead Reservation because Lewis and Clark assumed that they was getting, coming in contact with the group of people that had that they knew had a habit or or a cultural um, practice of flattening their children's heads, they would place a, a pressure on it um, and and shape it because the long forehead was considered um, considered uh, uh, handsome or 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 a thing or, or you know beautiful. But it wasn't the tribe here. That did that. It, it was there, there is a tribe that did something like that over further out on the coast, and but um, but Lewis and Clark that was, thought that was the tribe that they came upon. So then they called them the Flatheads, but it was completely different. So Flathead and Kootenai are really, are really not not what we are <laughs> from ourselves. And it's just just almost every tribe has the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, Kalispell is actually a mispronunci mispronunciation of Kalispell mm -hmm. and things like that. So, <laughs> more accurate than Indians. That's a yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, so that's and 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 people. You know, I had somebody who you know was um who um said that you know um call call this indians and said, yeah, asked me a question about indians and then quickly apologized and said um i'm sorry i'm sorry i i didn't mean to say indians i i i mean i meant native americans you know I, i'm sorry you know and but well i mean one is accurate as the other one. There's, there's no harm done, no foul. I, I, I always have said Indians. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm an Indian. You know, uh, which wasn't, <laughs> which wasn't, and you know, so uh, yeah, just, just what different people call, it, call it. not much, not much accuracy with. <laughs> throughout, throughout we get the, that question a lot from folks when we do professional development about what, what's the right term and. We say, you know, any of those, yeah, is probably okay. But really, if you can be tribally specific, that's the best. So um, Matt Bell says, can you share a little bit about how it works when you pluralize words? 
Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and it would depend a lot on the context for pluralizing. You know, like um, um, in Salish language, you know, um, they kind of double up the, you know, um, um, like, um, you know, they'll drop they'll drop the vowel and then double up the consonants that are there or, or in that syllable, double up the syllable, and it kind of can become um, plural. And in, in, in some cases, if you're talking about nouns. In the Kudli language, it depends on the context. If you're talking about us or you guys or them, then it would, you know, uh, how, it, how it gets pluralized is, is a little bit different, you know. Um, <clears throat> Like if I was going to say, um, 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 oh, uh, my my cup, huh? My cup is um, a tsunami, you know. But our cup, if I was talking, there's more of us. Our cup. Would be um, um, so the um, there's different um, prefixes and suffixes that add when you pluralize something as far as um, as far as you or I or us, but pluralizing something. Um, if it's somebody else, then it's then, then then it's changed a little bit different. And if it's if it's third person or even in, in the Kuni language, there's a fourth person as well. Um, you know, it, it would be said a little bit differently. Yeah, it, it, that that that's the, that 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 would take quite a bit more of a, a lengthy discussion. <laughs> Talk about um, pluralization. So, yeah, that, that, that gives you a taste of it. And, you know. Fascinating. Do we have other questions for, for Mr. Vernon here while he's here? Destin said he's all about lengthy discussions of pluralization methods, but he was a he was an English teacher, I think, at his former. So, um, oh yeah. Oh, but yeah. so what I'm understanding you to say there is that it's not so much a plural. It's a, it's a, almost like a pluralization of ownership or belonging or something. Yeah, and and the context. You know, and the context of what you're speaking about also. So you know that. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's a long one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if there's nothing else, um, we can probably go ahead and close this out and and thank you, uh, Vernon, for being here and and. Uh, working with us and I guess the the lesson is right we everything happens the way it's supposed to happen so today uh you were meant to be here for Jesse I guess <laughs> yeah I guess so. that was the reason I was late and the reason my part didn't work out is because I was supposed to intrude on his you know yeah. there's a and 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 there's a coyote story in that you know the the Kootenays and the and the Blackfeet well, I always kind of ribbed one another anyway. And I was, you know, I, I'm a stick game player and I love to put, you know, um, historically, I mean, throughout my life, the best games that I've played and the most fun games were when, uh, when I played the black sheet because, uh, because we rib each other and tease each other and, and are always, uh, I'll always add each other that way as well, but uh, but the stick game family is is one big family, and and, and you know, and, and my grandfather used to tell me that you know historically there wasn't an awful lot of killing that happened in the you know in the in the battles one another, a lot of taunting and a lot of that kind of stuff, and you know, going on, 
um, between between the tribes, but it wasn't an awful lot of killing. So you know, it 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 gets to that. You know, it it it, it turns into that, but but um, not really. And and so that's that's the part that that still goes on today. You know, some of the the, the folks that I rib the most and that we debate the most with are my black wheat friends and but they are also some of my some of my best friends as well so it's 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 it's, it's good it's good so um so me coming in and stepping on um stepping on jesse's time here you know was, uh, <laughs> was, was a kootenai was a kootenai black feet thing so you can tease him about that next time you yeah. see him yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. I appreciate those of you though who came on, who came on to see Mr. DeRosier and and ended up seeing a Putney guy instead. And, and I appreciate you, you, you staying on anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We uh yeah, we need to hear we need more Kootenai stuff. I think that's one of those things that we need more of. So today was a good day. All right, good. All right, well, thank you again. Thanks, everybody. I guess I'll give you about 15 minutes of your time back today. But go out there, and, and uh, I don't know what it's doing where you are, but it's starting to get sunny here in Helena. So, um, yeah, kind of go out and enjoy some sunshine for the rest of the afternoon. But uh, thank you, everybody who, who attended and stuck it out all day today. I uh, hope you got a lot out of it. Uh, just Just pleased and thankful. Uh, that we got so many folks and so many good presenters and thank you again Vernon and I'm I'm sure our paths will cross again so all right yeah you know right. um, it's, it's, yeah you better get out and grab some sundew because later on it'll probably snow again so. <laughs>